Hey everyone, it's August 12th and we are having an exciting day today. Uh, it is the weekly meeting of the Meteorite crew. It's just a group of guys who love talking about meteorites and it's sponsored by my company, Topher Spin Meteorites. Um, we have a lot going on. We have a lot of new people here today. Um, we have special guest and an even more special guest. An announcement about a special guest and then we also have Martin Lawler's The Beast getting cut tonight. So we're gonna take the camera into the garage and my buddy Billy is right here. <laughs> he's, been helping, uh, he's been helping us get our garage uh, reorganized and kind of redone. And this is the first time my uh, meteorite lab in the garage is gonna be fully operational like the Death Star. And we're gonna use it and cut a meteorite for the first time. Billy has never seen, and never seen a meteorite get cut before, so it's going to be pretty special. The one that we're cutting is Martin's The Beast, and I'll let him talk about that later on uh, and why it's so important. But uh, we have some really, really interesting new people here. So I'm going to uh, open it up to anyone who would like to have a story, anyone want to show anything off. Um, I know we have a question coming about some uh, fluorescent minerals in Albright's, but we're waiting for our specialists to arrive. So if anyone has anything to show, they can. If not, I have something that I want to get your opinion on. All right. Looks like we're looking at my lunar. <coughs> Excuse me. During my sale this past weekend, which, by the way, thank everyone for... Uh, for attending, for supporting my sales and helps allow me to do outreach like this. This is one of the items that I offered. It's a NWA 11877 Lunar. And I honestly bought uh, a good amount of it. So I didn't look at each individual piece. I weighed individual pieces, but I didn't really look at them individually until the sale and I zoomed in on it and I thought, oh my God, because we're looking at 5.44 grams. I don't know if that's even showing up. No, it does say 5.44 grams. And when I look at it, I hope this zooms in. There we go. This lunar actually appears to have crust on it. And if that is true, fusion crust, this is my only crusted lunar, and I almost sold it on Saturday. No one, I told people if they didn't buy it, it was going to be my personal collection. So can I get you guys' opinion? Is that crusted lunar? It looks like, it's blackish like crust. How thick is it? It looks, let me get my pointer. <clears throat> As you can see on this little edge right here, it seems to be extremely thin, yeah. as expected. Probably weathered. Yeah, most crusts I've seen are about a millimeter, a little less than a millimeter. But it, there is an obvious lip of it going all the way around. I don't know if you can see that. Hmm. So I'm not trying to sell it as fusion, uh, but I'm really am curious because if it is, I'm putting it in my in my collection. What, what would be, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. What would be some of the other possibilities of what they could be if it weren't crust? I'm just curious that that would be. It would be a desert varnish, wouldn't it? You think? Or shock veining. Shock veining. Shock veining is oftentimes a lot harder than the other material around it, so it'll stay more solid while everything else weathers around it. Okay. Mm. Wow. Because uh, I'm really, yes, really. true. Good. Shock veining usually are harder. Mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that particular number, whether or not it's got a lot of shock running through it or whether or not any other pieces were, uh, were crusty. I know a lot of times the lunar crust is like uh, more creamy. Yeah. But uh, when I saw that, I zoomed in, I was showing it off, and I was like, well, wait a second, guys. Is that, is that crust? So I'm going to get some other opinions on it, but I thought that was an interesting piece. Whoa, that I almost uh, sold on Saturday, and I would have honored it if someone bought it, but 
I'm super glad uh, no one no one jumped on it because I don't have a crusted lunar. So that's what um, I have. also uh, jumper the um, uh, the crust on lunars is often uh, a bit more of a brown color, not so much in the black tones, but in the browner tones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So you're you're basically that's a polite way of saying no then, or well you're doubtful. Uh, just just more information. Okay, I'll take that. I'll I'll take any information rather than everyone saying you're ridiculous. It's not fusion crust. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So I have um, a really absolute super amazing announcement but i'm not going to give it until uh, about next week's hangout until someone shows something off and i'll hmm. sit here in silence if i have to well i have a, a question now that uh the ultraviolet expert is here mr pat brown this is cameron smith talking talking yes so uh so, uh, As part of the uh, meteorite of the month, I got 3.7 grams of Norton County. And uh, my buddy uh, Mike Kelly said, hey, you should hit that with a uh, ultraviolet light. So, you want to take it out of the case? Yeah, I do. So, this is it. And it looks cool. But under UV, it's got this yellow. Yeah, spot. there you go. You get the, get the yellow. Yeah, that's it. Nice. Wow. Usually the uh, the fluorescent spots are quite a bit smaller than that. So what is that? That's a good. Um. So it's one of the minerals. Um. I don't remember right off the top of my head, uh, but it's one of the minerals that's in Norton County that's not common in other meteorites. Uh, and it, it's actually one of the very, very few meteorites that will fluoresce. That is wild. Dang. Hey, uh, the yellow's ferrocillite. Quick question. This is Christian, by the way. Um, what is the nanometer uh, rating for this light because I know there are you know different reactances to uh, different bands of UV and there are more than one available. Um, I would have asked Pat because Pat suggested it to me. It was the one I bought off Amazon that he suggested to me. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. This Hang one on. is, a, is a long wave 365 nanometer. Uh, so this of the long wave lights this is the sweet spot the El Cheapos are oftentimes 395 or 400 nanometers. Right. So this one is yeah. 360. Yeah, my big scorpion hunting light doesn't show anything. That is truly yeah. amazing because I've looked a, uh, quite a few because I've had in Tucson, I've had trays of Norton County uh, fragments in front of me and supposedly a good you know, uh, UV light. And every once in a while, you catch a little, but that is a, that is the biggest cluster of crystals I've seen like that. Yeah, that's really good ferrocilla. You got lucky, man, because this is my little Norton. Oh, Mike and, Kelly has one too. And uh, not uh, nada, you know. So you you got yourself a winner. That is crazy. Is that I'm Typically, gonna... of the several that I've looked at, they have about ten percent as much. Uh, of the mineral that fluoresces as that one. So, uh, Cameron, um, you uh, did really well on Meteorite of the Month Club there. Yeah, so uh, Norton County is like 85% uh, Encetite. So sometimes you'll get a little blue in that, and the ferrocillite is basically the rest of it, you know, and that's the yellow. I'm, I'm going to do a Me Too. In fact, I was going to do this earlier. I have a Nor Norton County. If we can get it focused here, 
it has a lot of the yellow in it. I just don't have a good way to show stuff, do I? Well, um, the uh, the UV lights, um, the majority of even the 365 nanometer ones do not have a bandpass filter on the front. Right. So you get a lot more uh, visible light in the purples. Uh, and uh, you can see the fluorescence with your eye, but it's much more difficult to catch on a camera. Yeah, this is camera this has got orange, started. yellowish, that yellowish ochre orange all through it. Yeah, I don't have a good, I don't have a setup where you can really, you can see a little bit. There it is. is on fire. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. Just, I, you know, if I could get a picture of what I was seeing in my hand, it's, I, I guess I got a little bit lucky also on the. Uh, yeah, um, awesome. Martin, if you uh, if you look on um, eBay, yeah, there are a number of Chinese sellers that sell the um, the three sixty five nanometer UV filter glass, and okay. there's a couple of three um, standard diameters of it. And the bigger standard diameter might just fit your uh, your flashlight there, and you'll be blown away by uh, the improvements uh, by just getting the UV and blocking most all of the visible light. I'll I'll do that. It's it's a cheap eBay light. I didn't even look for <laughs> didn't even look to see if it was a particular UV uh, what the nanometers were on it, but. Yeah, I'll do that because it, it looks beautiful even through this light. I just, I wish I could, uh, I may shoot a picture and post it sometime. Is this part of the CO group? No, it's an Albright. Oh, oh okay, okay, yeah. thank you. Thank yeah, you. Norton County is an Albright. Okay. Yeah, and there was just a uh, link sent out to everyone in the chat from Mike Kelly about it. I think I think it's the uh, forsterite rather than ferrocellite that, that fluoresces. Oh, by the way, that's uh, that particular my piece of Norton County that I got from Meteorite of the Month. Uh, Meteorite of the Month, fifty bucks a month. So I only paid fifty bucks for that. So if any of you are thinking wow. about investing, the Meteorite really? of the Month, it, it everything I've gotten, I've been a member since the beginning, and everything I've gotten has been something I would have bought myself if I had known where to get it. So and I'll check that's, it out. that's run by um, our friend uh, Mark Lyon and uh, Roberto Vargas. Oh, okay. And um, yeah, it, it's basically what it sounds like. You, you sign up for 50 bucks a month and you get everyone on the list gets the same meteorite once a month <clears throat> with great provenance. And it's usually well above 50 bucks. When uh, Cameron <clears throat> showed me that piece earlier today, uh, or yesterday, whenever it was, uh, I put a value on it for about 130 bucks. And then he said it was the meter of the month. And I'm like, wait, you got that for 50 bucks? Like, I'm going out of business. <laughs> oh, that, is a, <laughs> that is a smoking deal. And uh, I highly recommend everyone um, take advantage of it. I, I'm not in it, but man, I'm thinking about it. Every once in a while, I see what's given out and I'm like, Dang. Yeah, that kind of was right. It is. It is phosphorite. I'm sorry, not ferrocellite for uh, Norton for the other like 10, 15 percent. What was it one more time? It's phosphorite. Phosphorite. Yeah, it's mentioned in the article from uh, the the Met Times. I have uh, <clears throat> I have two items. Is Pat Brown have something to show off? I don't know yeah, yeah, I got a buzzard coolie yeah. I can try in the show off, oh. and it's uh, twenty-seven point three grams, and I guess buzzard coolie is from uh, Canada. Correct. I don't know if you can see it very well. It has a couple of uh, white areas in it, like the fusion crust got dinged. Uh, whether it was upon impact or not, I don't know. But it has nice fusion crust and also uh, visible, visible chondrules uh, popping up out of the uh, 
uh, fusion crust. We there you go. I believe it does. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can definitely see the. Wow. So Buzzer Cooley was actually hunted by one of our friends, uh, uh, Fred McPherson. And I don't know if he, oh, wow, he's actually on with us in the middle of moving. He's packed up and moving <laughs> to his new place, and he actually took time out of his day to join us. We're honored, Fred. Uh, he must be Faith Lippy. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you guys want to, uh, okay, it is now time for the special announcement. I am absolutely 100% pleased and I'm impressed I pulled this off. <laughs> uh, next week, anyone who joins us for our live will be granted a private after hours tour of ASU's Meteorite Vault with Dr. Lawrence Garvey himself. Uh, that is Everyone, I cannot believe we pulled this off. That's amazing. Yes, it's it's going to be uh, it's going to be quite an experience. We hope. What we're we're still doing. I mean, uh, we're still doing a a little bit of a behind the scenes work to see how it's best to do it. Um, ASU is pretty shielded building wise, and then as you move into the vault, you're going into an even more shielded environment and the wi-fi there is just awful uh, i tried to do a live broadcast on facebook last time asu had their open house and we did the open house and the video was, was sketchy at best so we're still figuring out how it's going to work but what we're thinking is if we don't get good reception with his laptop um, with Dr. Garvey's laptop inside the um, vault walking around, then he is going to put the, the outside the vault with a list of all the meteorites that we have asked him to pull from the ASU collection for us solely to enjoy live. I think that's amazing. So uh, Dr. Garvey is, is an amazing thank you yeah we're getting we're getting rounds of applause going around so. that is awesome <laughs> yeah. now could i ask a question does a asu have their own uh video or cinematographer uh group on campus to where somehow i don't know if it's uh, crossing lines here and boundaries that you would have to pay for them to do the video other yeah. than yourself this is this is more of a, a special favor um, mm -hmm. that Dr. Lawrence Garvey is doing um, to help to help us out. He knows that uh, I invest quite a bit of my time into outreach, and I consider these uh, hangouts outreach because uh, my goal is to have a very live, interactive, huge group of, of collective intelligence of meteorites and interest in meteorites. Uh, and everything related, uh, ha and then have that lively discussion put on 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 YouTube, and drive meteorites and our hobby and our passion and everything that we do to a brand new audience who doesn't even know that this exists and is potential. So on that thread, I just had a, that major announcement. I would ask you all to do me one favor. I've never asked this before, but as you go to my YouTube channel, if you've enjoyed what you watched, please go to every single video and hit like. I feel stupid asking for likes, but my, my wife said it's normal and I shouldn't feel retarded. But if you would like all my videos, they show up higher in the algorithm and more people will be exposed to meteoritics and that's the goal. That's definitely the goal. So I'm not asking out of vanity. I'm asking purely so we can get the algorithm to like us as much as we love us. Because we're freaking awesome. Take my word for it. I will share with all my contacts. Absolutely. That's sure. phenomenal. Um, Neil, I'm looking at you. Do we have a thumbs up, thumbs down? 
All right. Uh, this is uh, another surprise app. I was hoping this would be pulled off, um, but it's a surprise to me that it happened today. So we, I'm really honored to welcome back one of our special guests from probably about a month and a half ago, Neil Buckland. He's a, a professional photographer that I met in um, Seattle. He has partnered with Dr. Tony Irving, who is a, um, a meteorite classifier, works at, uh, he's a professor emeritus at Washington University. I really hope I got that correctly. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, so, go ahead. University of Washington. University of Washington. It, it, there are two Washington universities. One's in St. Louis, Missouri. Yes. Uh, but the university he is at is where my son's in med school. So it's, it's University of Washington, Seattle. Right. Thank you. And what, uh, Neil, if you look back at our previous videos, it's about photography in thin sections. It's a wonderful video. Was really pleased to have Neil on board for that. Well, he's actually joining us today. He's launching uh, the web page. Uh, he has a brand new web page. We're going to you now, and um, it is just a beautiful interactive meteorite um, page and photography page. And like I said, he's partnered with Dr. Tony Irving, and we actually have the doctor on the line with us today. No, unfortunately, uh, oh. Tony Tony wasn't able to get it. Uh, get logged in on his ancient laptop. So we, we uh, had his interest and his <laughs> desire to be here. So that I'm gonna I'm gonna count that as a win. Yeah, maybe another time he'll he'll I'll I'll get him over the um, the login troubles and he okay. can uh, join us. Nice. Yeah. Tell us about your new project. Uh, yeah. So hi everybody. If you've uh, seen me before, then nice to sort of see you again. This is. I don't know if this can way. Yeah. Um, you can see behind me, this is a, an Angrite, as, as Topher pointed out. This is um, a thin section image of um, NWA 7203. Um, and so what I do, um, I partnered with um, Tony Irving, uh, who's the meteorite scientist at the University of Washington, uh, starting a couple of years ago. And I've been photographing uh, thin sections through a microscope that I built myself uh, to get the best uh, image quality that I could. Uh, and so that has now evolved into the website that I'm just now launching, which I sent a, a, a link, or I sent the, web, sent the web address to the group chat. Uh, but if you don't see it there, it's cosmicmicroscapes.com. And it's really exciting, not only because it's a way for me to share the images that I'm creating, but also uh, I've, I've sort of, with a, with a little poking and prodding, I've convinced Tony to actually be part of my website and he's uh, authoring uh, blog pages uh, about these meteorites. And so if you go to that page right now, you'll see something that um, nobody else has seen yet which is uh, an incredibly high resolution image of the exciting new Erg Chech 002 meteorite, uh, as well as Tony's um, article, which it's, it's, in the, it's in the blog. And uh, should, I, should I share my screen and pull it up that way or is everybody going to the webpage? Yeah, okay. No, I, I'm gonna ask that you uh, go ahead and, and share your screen so we have as much of a, of a great okay. YouTube experience as possible. Okay, wow. so hang on, I don't, why am I not seeing the right page? Okay. Are you seeing the web page now or not? I can't tell. I don't know what's. Yes. Yeah. I can see it. We're seeing it. Right. Okay. Uh, so, um, wish I could get rid of that screen. Okay, there we go. So yeah, so this is the new web page, um, Cosmic Microscapes, uh, seeing into rocks from space, and. Um, as you can see, you know, right now I have um, three different meteorites on here. Uh, Awinet Lagra, Itki, 
and ergchech 2 And what I typically do is I come through and I will photograph one of these uh, specimens in multiple um, uh, uh, polarized light. So, so we'll have cross polarized light, which is what this one is here in ITKI. And then I also shoot it again with parallel polarized light and sometimes something in between. So, and then I create these, these art pieces that, you know, you can, the way this new website is set up so that you could actually buy a piece. Uh, I will, I will print it and make it by hand and make my own frame. I have tools and everything and make my own picture frames and stuff like that. So, um, these are pretty cool. The, the, what Tony is uh, joining in on. So this is the new image of Ergchech002, which nobody has seen yet. And if, by the way, if you're on this page on your computer, you can click on this image here and it takes you into a deep zoom interface and you can actually zoom in at incredible high resolution and pan around inside the image. Uh, and these images are, are enormous. You can see down there, it's a, a 12 feet wide by six and a half feet high. So if I were to, the, the resolution that I'm capturing on this microscope I built is, is so high that I'm, I make, I, I'm actually making prints that are 12 feet, 15 feet, 25 feet wide, and they're unbelievably detailed. Um, and of course, uh, here, that was the, cr the cross polarized version. And here as well, is the parallel polarized version. So it's the same exact specimen shot with a different alignment of the polarizing filters, which allows me to just come up with a different uh, color palette. And as a photographer, I'm approaching this, uh, you know, with the mindset of appreciating art and beauty. Um, I don't know very much about the science behind any of this. Um, I always tell Tony that it's it's up to him to to tell me what I'm looking at, and so uh, I don't actually write any of the scientific descriptions. So um, you'll notice that any of these uh, pieces we have a, a very small description uh, on the individual crops that I select for for prints, as well as Tony has written. Uh, a more detailed um, description, like a like a what we think. I think of this as kind of like a like an art gallery caption. So when I do make these prints and hang them in art galleries or at museums, this would be the caption that Tony's written to help uh, describe what people are looking at. And then the really exciting thing that I'm getting Tony to join in on is he is actually. Uh, writing these blog articles, which are his scientific uh, abstracts that he submits um, to um, various, uh, I, I'm not sure where, he wrote this one for a conference that's coming up um, in a couple of months here, later this year. Um, and I, I, I had to <laughs> <laughs> I love Tony, but I, I have to work sometimes to, to uh, talk him into um, creating a version for people who aren't geologists. So I, I convinced him to let me put this little glossary in the middle of the page because I don't know what any of these words are. So, so I wanted to be able to read this thing and, and understand it. <laughs> so uh, what's cool about this this thing that we're doing is that you know, I make the images, uh, and they're they're detailed and rich and and fun to look at. But I, and then I get Tony to describe them for me. But since I don't know the science, I'm able to uh, convince him to explain it to me, so that we can come up with some language that's easier for for non scientists to appreciate what what we're seeing in the images. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that way you can hang it on your wall and not feel stupid at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And the, when, uh, when I spent time with Tony, uh, I feel a couple calling him Tony now. <clears throat> when I spent time with Tony and Neil and uh, 
um, uh, John Higgins up in Seattle. What was really interesting, the feedback, the scientists, and also when I went to ASU with Neil, the feedback we got from the scientists for the first time, the way I describe it is imagine looking at a beautiful mountain vista. Um, you know, you're out camping and, and, and all you see is this beautiful mountain vista, but you're looking at it through binoculars. So you can only appreciate great detail and you have to kind of patch it together in your head, kind of what it looks like on a grand scale. So what Neil has been able to accomplish in his proprietary um, camera mount uh, and optics setup is to capture hundreds of, of pictures and then stitch them together to create a, a zoomable, like almost like an infinitely zoomable photo. So the scientists for the first time are able to view the entire slide at, at great, you know, and just appreciate everything all together and then zoom in wherever they want. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Oh, also one other thing that I just um, uh, put on the website yesterday. Um, if you look on the uh, book section, um, the last time I joined the meeting here, um, I showed you guys a book that I had printed up that Tony and I designed together. We made three copies of this uh, book that was a um, catalog for a private meteorite collector. Uh, and so what, after talking, after talking at length, uh, Tony and I decided uh, we'll, um, we'll make a limited edition version of this available uh, for, for collectors to, to have this, this uh, book of meteorites. And the, the, I took all the photos myself, so they're all extremely high resolution and detailed images. Um, and, uh, so what, what this will be, and I, and I, 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 I'm not really much of a collector kind of guy. So I, you tell me, I think uh, Topher is more of a collector type than I am, but, um, you know, I had the impression that people like the idea of knowing that, um, there really are only three copies of this, uh, coffee table book. Um, I have one, Tony has one, and the guy who owns the collection has one. That's and that's it. Uh, so w these uh, paperback versions that we're going to make, um, there's only, I'm only going to make 100 prints, and then that's it. So um, that's available. Um, you'll see this, this isn't ready yet, but um, coming soon, we're going to have, Tony and I are working on a, a multi-volume uh, a collection of books of the thin section images. Uh, we have we have outlined uh, contents for 12 issues. Hmm. Think of this as like a magazine on steroids, but obviously no ads or anything. So it'll be a it'll be a um, like a staple bound, uh, really high quality printed um, booklet type thing, but oversized and extremely detailed images all of the thin sections and those will also be limited once we start uh, actually um, uh, putting them out so those will be limited edition as well uh yeah, me, may i ask a question yes please ask are those, Im those images yes are those photo stacked they're they're the final not, so they're image? not they're not focus stacked uh part okay. of Part of because because um, it would just be too many images to, to yeah. deal with, um, and also in a lot of my testing, I found that if I if I do a focus stack in addition to the detail that I'm capturing, it's sort of visually overwhelming. It it's too much detail. So uh, what I did is I, I designed a microscope that allows me to level this, the slide perfectly. So, I mean, I've got these tiny little micrometer screw adjusters that allow me to take the, the slide and level it perfectly so that when I move it around to capture, I capture two millimeters at a time. When I move it from here to there, it's still in focus. 
And oh, that's, yeah. that's very hard to do. It took me a long time to engineer something that would work for that. Um, right. what, what is your focal uh, depth? Because I know a thin section is usually about 30 microns. So the section is 30 microns thick. That's the standard thickness. Um, the actual depth of field, which is the amount of sharp focus we get from the lens I'm using is 3.4 microns. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> it was shocking to me when Pat Brown uh, hooked up my first microscope for me and I got my, uh, my first thin section slide uh, on there and, and I'm looking through it and I finally got the binocular uh, aspect of it to work. So I finally saw 3D and my mind was blown. Then I realized you can zoom in and go different layers of the thin section. And the thin section is only 30 microns. And I know I'm not using the best equipment in the world. I mean, does Pat Brown put it together? No. But um, it's just amazing. So yeah, so you have like 3.4 microns. Yeah, and you know, technically the depth of field is claimed to be 3.4 microns, but you know, if you're if you're looking at the the, the top of that 3.4 versus the bottom of that 3.4, they're not they're not equally sharp. Mm -hmm. So you're really getting a, a pretty narrow range of what is actually going to be sharp in, in each in each capture. Now your lighting is coming up underneath the yes. thin slice. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm shining light through the bottom of the specimen. Uh, and 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 then of course going through two layers of polarizing filter. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. And if, if anyone hasn't had the opportunity um, to play with thin sections and literally just cheap, um, they they look like uh, overhead projector films of polarized films. And until you mess with that for your first time and see everything shift and change color and, and then reverse and then go totally black out, it's, it's a pretty, every time I experience it with someone for the first time, they're impressed. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that was my experience, uh, I don't know, about two or three years ago, maybe three years ago, with Tony, uh, after we finished that, that meteorite catalog um, for the private collector, Tony came to the studio and asked me to photograph this thin slide. Uh, it's a little piece of glass with a, you know, a sliver of rock on it. And I, I didn't really think anything of it. I was like, oh, sure, I guess I can scan that for you. Why not? And, and then he showed, he pulled out those, these crummy, you know, scratched up plastic polarizing filters and, and he put it on a light table and showed me the, 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 birefringence and I my head exploded I, I immediately was like what is this yes, crazy yeah. beautiful stuff what and magic I, is this yeah and I knew that I had to capture it and so that's what started this whole obsession it really has been an obsession that's, in the last three cool. years well, yeah I, I remember I still have the video and maybe I'll, I'll try to find it and put a link in in when I post this video but uh of you of you in your uh, installment at the at the, uh, the yeah, art yeah, yeah. display, uh, we were at the counter, and he had some thin sections, and he was trying to describe to people what they're seeing because really hard to get unless you unless you have someone to explain it to you, and he was actually demonstrating it, and like when it's 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 honest. It, when when you when you, when he does it for the first time, and, and the audience gasps and like, oh my god, go back. Like it is, it is funny, it is honest, and I am so glad I had my camera running because I'm honestly responding to like seeing it for my second time. So it, it's a great video, and it, it's a fond memory of, of spending that time with, with you together uh, and with a bunch of other people in, in Seattle. It was a good, good time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, I have to ask you, I don't know if you're ready for it, but the uh, rotator, a little 3D thing. Uh, Oh, uh, so the last, um, the last time I was on the the, the Zoom meeting, uh, I was showing some some three D spinning images that I made of some rock specimens, uh, and I I had I, I was building the website previously on a different platform, 
uh, and decided uh, to start over with a different system because of various reasons. And so um, I just haven't quite gotten around to um, adding that to the current version of the website, but it, but I will. Uh, and I actually have um, a couple of uh, a couple of meteorite dealers actually have sent me um, several specimens, several rocks that they want me to photograph uh, for helping them sell the rocks. So uh, this week I'll be shooting those and then adding them to the website. You'll see there's a blank page on the site right now that just says meteorites. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm planning to put them. Yeah, you, you click on it. You actually uh, oh. spin the spin the rock around. Uh, uh, and view it from all angles. I have a, uh, I have one that I want that done with, but it's not for sale. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, it's, it's my self-standing, it has a self-standing tripod and it has 3D shock vanes, 360. It's an amazing piece. So I would love to have that photograph, but uh, I, I do want to piggyback your comments about your book. Uh, mm. the, the paperback versions coming out. Uh, I think that is amazing because um, printing uh, and binding is expensive as yeah. hell. Yeah. I was blown away. I, I just did this and this is, this is massive for me. I think I showed it off last one, but I just did my own collection book. It's mm -hmm. 110 pages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and it is um, just, I, I really took my time going through and it's just beautiful detail. Um, but this is like a one of one because no one's gonna pay crazy money like I did for pictures of my rocks. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it was fun putting that together, but to have actually museum quality pieces professionally lit and photoed uh, and then Print it up, you know, not on a webpage.com. It's just, I, I'm looking forward to seeing those. So uh, there, somebody just um, made a, posted a message, uh, I think it's Cameron, uh, asking for, please offer autographed copies. And actually, yeah, so all uh, I wanted to mention, it says it on the page, all of the prints that we're going to make, the 100 copies, will be um, numbered and signed by both me and Tony. If I can convince him to actually sign all hundred copies, then he'll yeah. be, he'll be signed by him as well. <laughs> Tony's awesome. uh, Tony and I work very well together, but he's um, uh, he gets a little um, tired of of doing the, the the little stuff. He wants to be focused on studying the rocks, <laughs> yeah, especially when he has uh, you know finally time back in the uh, back in the lab after this whole COVID thing. Maybe one day I'll talk him into letting me uh, go over to his house and we can do it. We can join the Zoom from there. If you see his living room and dining room, uh, it's just piled high, stacked high with uh, specimens that people have sent him to, to, to classify. I mean, the guy is from all over the world. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of things that, that are waiting for him to get to. Yes, yeah. really, kind of, man. I, I mean, we're, and we're we're almost fortunate enough to have him tonight. <laughs> <laughs> near miss, near miss. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what, guys. Uh, Neil, we appreciate you joining us today and uh, and plug in plug in away. I, I'm, it's that's why that's why this this platform exists, so friends can help each other build their biz or build their businesses and and get the word out there of what they're doing and just create a buzz and. Uh, just, you know, help each other, so. And speaking, yeah. uh, I could say one last thing, uh, yeah. directly responding to that. Um, I'm not usually like this, but but I'm gonna go ahead and do this as a, as a sort of a, an appeal. Um, as a commercial photographer, uh, you can imagine that my business has completely imploded since COVID started. I've had zero income since February. Wow. So, uh, while I'm sitting at home twiddling my thumbs hoping things will get better, I've been building this website. So if you do decide you want one of these prints or one of these books or I can do custom things as well, just know that you're helping a starving artist uh, survive the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, 
And and I mean the dude needs a haircut. Look at it. Yes. Look at it. Yes, I have not had a haircut in six months. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, Neil, we we hear you, buddy. That that's why. Yeah. That's why when you when you wanted to come on, well, you, when you just hit me up to hey, let's talk. You got my you got my time. So yeah, um, yeah. That I definitely want to support you in your efforts. Um, I think we're going to shift gears right now because I'm going to cut the beast. So let me see if I can find the camera. That's okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. I'm going to start this video and we're going to go mobile. Sounds like a metaphor. Cut the beast. Yeah. I'll tell you what. <laughs> Here. I'm going to lose audio, I think. All right. A little echo there. Topher, if you can hear us, we can't hear you. There's no sound. All right. You hear me now? There yes. you go. Yeah. All right. We are heading out of my office, and if you notice, right on my wall, I have my Neil Buckland print right there. Excellent. Wow. And that, that was a custom yeah. one that uh, no one else will ever have. He was in my studio uh, when he came to Seattle, and it, I had a 12-foot print of that on the wall, uh, oh, leaning wow. against the wall. Uh, and and obviously he 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 didn't have a way of taking the twelve foot version home, so, uh, so we, we we spent some time on the computer looking around inside the giant image and selected something that he could uh, carry on the plane. Well, he didn't take it on the plane. I, I, yeah. I actually drove it to his house in uh, Arizona. Well, no, I didn't do that. But, but I, 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 I delivered it. Uh, Albuquerque. Yes, right. Yeah, I left university, it. University. It, it was a All baton right. handing off through um, somebody at a, at uh, ASU. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's wrapped in the white thing. We just realized we came out to the garage. We didn't bring the rock. So, yeah, <laughs> you guys get to look around my garage for a second. <laughs> Make sure you get the right piece now. <laughs> so this is my uh, my meteorite cutting center. Mm -hmm. They're both high tech. I have the high tech eight inch angled lap, mm -hmm. and then the high tech six inch little cutter. Thanks to uh, my buddy Mark Mike Markowitz. There we go. Even my sign. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, got my neon signs going. All right. So now. Let's see here. All right, I'm gonna give this to my buddy and he's going to, oh, there we go. There you go. All right. This is just awesome, Topher. <laughs> the very clean garage we've got there. Harden's biggest. Yeah. And um, the reason we're cutting this is for classification. Martin has the big hunk, I have the small hunk, and we're cutting a piece off for classification. Yeah, if you so look in my uh... we're working with, and this is where the two puzzle pieces m match up. I totally, totally think this is beautiful and sexy, and I don't want to remove any of it. Although this is the smartest place to remove. But what I'm going to do is instead cut some of this off. What I want to do is be able to give the lab a nice crusted side, an exposed side, and then some secondary crusts. So we're going to take off a lot more than 20 grams, but this is what we're going for right here. You guys can see that line. Does that make sense? Yeah. If people look in my uh, window, you'll see the other, other half of it. Uh, live, <laughs> my special guest tonight. Is that a carbonaceous chondrite? No, this is probably an L6. Okay. 
right. And we're going for a little hefty slice here. I don't mind giving the lab more than 20 grams. I want them to have a good, a good sample that shows a little bit of everything. It's really important for them to have a little bit of everything so they can give it an accurate classification. What type of saw blade do you use? Is that a diamond or what? Um, this one right here, is, yeah, it's a diamond imp imp impregnated one. Okay. Um, but uh, most of the time when I'm cutting anything with, with heavy metal in it, I'm using a CBN blade, a carbide, whatever blade. Okay. So here we go. Yeah, that's the pro slicer. What, what's your cutting fluid? Generally, for stone meteorites, we cut with water. water. Uh, occasionally, people add uh, a little additive to it. Uh, but uh, uh, when I cut, I use distilled water. And when I get to cutting some of the better stuff, the uh, carbonaceous chondrite stuff, uh, I'm going to use um, uh, isopropyl alcohol. Yeah, I was going to say uh, alcohol would be, uh, I think, a better way to go. What's the horse power on that motor? Uh, with iron, and, uh, like a fresh fall or fresh find with any iron particles. You don't really want, you don't yeah. want water. Yeah, water. Right. Yeah, you gotta bake it out. <clears throat> Alcohol is a little difficult in that, uh, especially for meteorites with any, uh, any metal, uh, you can occasionally get a spark and isopropanol burns with a blue flame and it's yeah. very difficult to see. So uh, <laughs> it's not for the faint of heart. The other thing with ISO anyway is you're still not completely dry as far as the alcohol goes. There's also um, a little water. Well, depends on yeah. which isopropanol. Uh, I've got 99.9%. Uh, Wow. That's a really nice cut. That's awesome. Hey, Topher. Yep. That'll make a hell of a thin section. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We got a good line of crust like I want it. Very we nice. We have uh, some exposed weathering right there with some uh, caliche. Some secondary fusion crust. And some... Uh, Exposed weathering. So yeah, that's a good sample for them. What's and the you know what's power about, on your motor? What's great about sending stuff to the lab is you don't need to really finish it off. <laughs> <laughs> Which lab are you sending it to? Um, this is going to our friend in uh, Florida State, uh, Daniel Shake. Okay. So once I have my uh, my lap filled with water, I'll lap this up and finish it up. But yeah, I'm thinking that's uh, it's probably an L6. That's gorgeous. So there we have it. The beast has been slain. <laughs> hey, hey Topher, can, like can you hear me? I'm not sure if my yep. mic's on or not. That's awesome. You're, you've been my midwife on this. This is great. Yep, there we have it, folks. Thank you. Dream come true for me. <laughs> nice, Martin. Yeah, that's just Topher. That that's amazing. That's <laughs> I encourage people buy meteorites from Topher. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that's I'm I'm serious. Uh, He's doing me a huge, huge favor, and it's just I I told him I'd try not to tear up tonight watching this. <laughs> I mean, I, I to a lot of y'all, this is old hat. This is my first experience with this. Yeah, so this, that's amazing. Yeah, this is Martin's first one. Yeah, that's yeah. just thank you so much for well, doing it live too. Right? Yeah, well, I I told you if we could pull it off, we would. If the scheduling, if, if my garage got done and the scheduling worked out, it would be live. So yeah, well, I know I'm you super went, happy. I know you went to some trouble to make this happen. So I that don't <laughs> don't think that it not appreciated. Oh, yeah. Billy had a good part in making it happen too. Thank Billy, you, Billy. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Billy. yeah. Yeah, so there's here's my uh, here's my special floor. I don't know if you can see that it's glittery. Mm -hmm. 
That's the that's the wife's choice. This was my this is my choice. Can anyone guess what I have in epo epoxied into my floor? Meteorites. You betcha, boys. Yeah. <laughs> of course. What else would you do? I know. I'm the only one that had the meteorites on impregnated <laughs> in their floor. Yeah. You're you're obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> Like he's the only one, right? Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, oh, right. <laughs> five, five bucks. Five bucks says it, it's going to be all the rage in 2021 if yeah. we're not dead of coronavirus. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah, we're going to go up into the front of the house. That is we have, have air awesome. conditioning. Well, I've, had, little, I've little got many, story. many rocks, but never a meteorite. Yeah, this little. is just a special treat for me. I, yeah. I, I don't know what to say. I, I can't bring myself to cut meteorites, frankly. I, yeah, oh, I, I leave as received. Can I share a little more. story about cutting meteorites? As a member of a rock and mineral club for 23 years, I, I went over to wholesale and a lady had some nantans in a, in a burlap bag. She asked me if we cut geodes and stuff, we had a saw and I told her yes. She says, if you cut this for me, you can come back here and pick out any meteorite out of the bag for free. Unbeknown to me, that uh, putting it on the saw, 10 inch uh, saw, Perfect. slabbing saw, it heated up the motor so badly, it almost oh. wound up being destroyed. It was smoking. <laughs> so uh, you gotta be careful when you're cutting those things. That's for sure, Art. Is Nantan that hard? Uh, it's all metal, it's pretty oh. hard, yep. Yeah, you know, the, the difficulty with cutting the metal uh, meteorites is that uh, with a diamond blade, they tend to load up the blade, especially yeah. if you're cutting with water. So mm -hmm. generally, uh, nickel iron meteorites are cut with the CBN, the cubic boron nitride blade, and uh, you use oil uh, rather than water. No, I, I, I had a, a, a Millennium Lusa that I had a machinist friend of mine cut in our machine shop where I used to work. And he, he said it was the hardest thing he's ever seen. And they cut all kinds of aer aerospace grade metal. So um, that, that impressed me. I mean, wow. Absolutely. That's the other half of the beast. Nah, yeah. I, yeah, that's, that's the. Yeah, wow. That's. One side, and it's like, I think Dustin Dickens is on here, but he was making some comments on it, and he said it seems to have every kind of weathering you can find on a meteorite, which is sort of fascinating when you look, yeah. take a look. Crust and... That is cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a... Topher found it. Topher's the one who... The one at midnight... Y'all probably heard... I'll shorten this, but... You know, at midnight, I get a text and told said, I found the one. I found the one to do it to. <laughs> really? Yeah. So he sent me some pictures and, you know, about I couldn't sleep the rest of the night. So we, we, <laughs> we, got, we got the deal done before, either, before I went to sleep. So, well, yeah. The, so this the, interesting, is, the fun thing about it was it's, it's Martin's first uh, classification. Not that I'm, you know, an experienced class. I only have two to my name. A lot more in the works right now. But it was fun because I knew it had to be a, he's not going to be selling this thing. That, that's an oriented half of a puzzle. It's, he's not going to be selling it. So I wanted to make sure that I picked out a, a collector's rock, a piece, a piece that he would love and appreciate in its fullness. And the fact that it's a puzzle, we are co-main mass holders forever links us together as meteorite brothers in the Met Bowl. I love and, I think it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> love that. And, and, you know, I'm going to be uh, Met Brothers with Oz two times over in the next coming weeks. Uh, and that's just, that's just fantastic. I mean, that's, that's why cool. we do this stuff, you know? Very but cool. I really wanted to pick out a piece that, that he would keep and, and be, it's a display piece. It's not just a hunk of rock or a meteorite for meteorite's sake. It is actually a beautiful piece. And when we get together in Tucson eventually, um, I guess I can can't. When we get together in, uh, in Tucson eventually, I'm gonna put the other half of the rock together and, and we're going to, uh, oh, wow. Okay, it's gonna happen now. Um, I need, there we go. 
I'm almost tearing up for you, Martin. Oh, I appreciate that. Oz is just, I, <laughs> I, I, I've never, I, it's, I, you know, I've watched some cutting videos, but uh, when you got investment in it and, you know, you got a friend like Topher doing it, that that's really a, pretty. I'll be watching the video again. <laughs> <laughs> and again and again. And yes. <laughs> Wow. Alien sound effects. <laughs> it's screaming, oh, after, screaming after All being right. cut. There. Okay. I was just going to show off this piece a little bit more. It cuts super easy. Billy was surprised how easily it, it cut. There's, it there's cut not the a fans. whole lot of metal. Uh, let me get my trusty perfectly honed earth magnet that I know exactly how it, it's got some good pull to it. It's, it's definitely an L. Um, there are some nice, let me zoom in. See some chondrules. Uh, the crust. It's such a gorgeous crust. Mm -hmm. There we go. So this is going to be, this is like just over 53 grams and it's going to be packed up and sent to Daniel Shake. I already promised him it'd be in the mail by the 17th, so I'm ahead of schedule. <laughs> finally, I'm finally ahead of schedule. What's neat about this, um, let me get my pointer. Um, we got a shock vein right here, I believe. Yeah. Um, unless that's just my blade. When you classify them, do you get the thin section? Uh, I'm going to have to clean that up a little bit, but it, it may actually be a nice little shock vein. They'll usually uh, keep that on, on deposit or the classification will usually oh, hold on a second. I got I got yeah, speaking to that question specifically, the reason why Tony has thousands of uh, thin sections for me to photograph is because every every piece that he classifies, he keeps the thin section. I don't know why I can't hear. I think if he were sending off a rock, it would be nice to get a thin section back as well. It's as, it's as easy to make two thin sections as it is to make one. But you, you can ask for it. You can have it both ways. Uh, <laughs> I, sent one, I sent one off to Daniel Shake uh, not long ago here this hopefully LL three point something. And uh, it had a couple of different lithologies and I really wanted Daniel to be able to see both of them. And so I paid to have a second uh, thin section made out of the two different uh, areas of the rock. And uh, one of them will come back to me uh, when the classification is done. And on that one, um, without a rush, it was 45 bucks uh, for the outfit to make a thin section. So are you having to make thin sections or probe mounts or ball or just thin sections? Okay. This was actually a thin section. Um, there's, there's a lot of different uh, things that people are doing, you know, thicker probe mounts. Uh, thin section is nice because you can use it really for both. Um, the uh you know you can see the internal chondral structures on that and uh you know it's uncovered and so you know they'll they'll uh sputter it with carbon uh and uh, uh and use it in the in the uh microprobe uh and this one is going to be the normal uh was it 26 by 48 or so millimeters but a lot of them are now going to 25 millimeter round uh, that's what sections. I, that's what mm. I'm working doing. It's just not because the thin sections aren't awesome, but they just, you don't use them that often in the actual classification process, unless you start drilling down, you know, 80, 90% of the time, you're, you really don't need to do it. And so that's just a finer process, you know, um, but, uh, but I like doing both if possible. I think personally. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, really I'm sure from, from for the kind of media that I'm interested in. <laughs> Sorry, over. Sorry, I was trying to say from my perspective as a photographer, um, the thin section is the most interesting part. Oh yeah, for sure. And and I, I, I mean, exactly. And, but, and, and by the way, uh, I should I have to make a plug for what, what Tony and I both kind of feel is probably one of the, one of the highest quality thin section labs in the world is um, Spectrum Petrographics in uh, Vancouver, Washington. And I've, I've personally photographed a bunch of different thin sections from, that are made by all kinds of people. And without question, hands down, the highest quality sections for photography are made by Spectrum. That it, it's a huge difference in the quality of the image. Do you happen to know in Vancouver? Vancouver, Vancouver, Washington. What, 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 what makes the quality different? Uh, well, so their, their, their level of polish and their, their uh, sections are also uh, very precisely parallel. So one of the things that I run into when I'm doing the photography, one end of this, uh, if, if one end of the slice is just a tiny bit thinner than the, than the other end, um, the colors fade, all right? And so... Right. If it's not a perfect 30 microns across the entire length of the slide, uh, then I don't, I don't really get a consistent image. So there's two things there. It's the, the perfect uh, consistency of thickness and um, their uh, level of polish is r really spectacular. And he even offers something, uh, you can order an upgraded section, which is doubly polished, which yeah. basically is, um, they, you know, they take the, the initial billet that they make uh, for, for before they mount it to the glass, they polish that first, then epoxy it to the glass, then slice off like less than a millimeter, and then grind it down and polish that. So it's polished on both sides uh, of, the, of, the sli of the slice. Yeah, yeah we, we make these double polished slides as well, but we make them for doing fluid inclusion work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the the only other thing I would say is uh, I think um, Mike's uh, the, the 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 guy who owns uh, Spectrum is Mike Depanger. Um, I I drove through and and um, 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 toured his uh, his shop and showed him his, my uh, my images. And um, he one of the things he he showed us is that they he formulated his own special uh, recipe for the epoxy. I mean, I, I don't know what he does, but there are almost no bubbles in any of his thin sections. And I've seen a lot of thin sections that have bubbles. Uh, and of course, that, that sucks for, for photography, too. Totally. Yeah, there's a huge range of epoxies yeah. for doing these different viscosities. Yeah. Put it under a vacuum yeah. and you could probably suck all the bubbles out. Well, yeah. yeah. The sure that you hear it out is really important also. The which? Hearing is, is a big deal. Can be. Yes. The, yeah, the temperature of curing is a big deal. I, I get epoxy from Burnham Petrographics, and it's a special epoxy that has the same index or refraction as the glass slides. And uh, you, you buy a, a surface thermometer and cure it at a particular temperature. And if you get, it, get the temperature right on, you can fine tune the uh, uh, the refractive index of the epoxy itself and make that glass to epoxy transition disappear. Uh, heating plates, those those really fine heating plates, the magnetic stirrer heating plates work really nicely for that. What I got? Yeah, you can even uh, uh, connect it to a let's say a thermal control sensor and just regulate right up until the surface that you're applying the substance to is at that exact cure temperature so yeah. fiddle with it until you get that you know that uh that thermal insulation value just kind of set perfectly absolutely what, what, what i often do is um stick stick my epoxy in the microwave it's, it's setting one for a minute right and it, it gives you a perfect runny but don't ever put it in at setting 10 for a minute which i did once <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> because the thing, the thing almost explodes when it comes out. I had to, the fire, the fire brigade came. I, I was in the lab. I was in the lab, and I was. I could see the thing starting to smoke. <laughs> oh God! So I had to get my lab coat off and tried to wave the smoke away from the fire detector. <laughs> I, I wasn't successful. And two fire engines turned up. <laughs> I'm sure, it didn't smell very good either. <laughs> yeah, so Burnham Petro Graphics sell this really cool little thermometer that's one of the, you know, bimetal strip roundup sort of things. And the bimetal strip sits right on the top of the lab uh, heating plate. And the dial is actually attached to the end of the bimetal strip. So the dial rotates. Uh, and then there's a finger that shows you the, the temperature, but it senses right slap on the top of the lab uh, heating kind of surface plate. It from your, you have a digital plate. Do you get a, what kind of a difference variance do you get from the actual slide versus the, what the, what the temperature reading says on the plate? Yeah, my plate is not a digital one. It's a, it's an analog one. And so I set it to about the temperature and I, I just bought a, uh, one of these, uh, cheap Chinese forehead thermometers, but it has an emissivity setting for other stuff. So I, I haven't played with it uh, yet, but the, uh, this little uh, surface thermometer gets me. Reading I'm getting on my plate is actually not really accurate and I could get better on it. On yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this one, the, the dial, it's, it's a, it's a dial that goes from, uh, room temperature of 400 or something in half a turn. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a joke. But this little surface thermometer, I'm sure I did with it. I just ripped my tsunami uh, part, or my, sorry, my typhoon apart. Um, my thermal night just went dead on me. <laughs> uh, $2,000 heating plate. Uh, Stir up. Uh, uh, I'm like, Mine was a eBay special for 50 bucks. <laughs> um, Topher, I've got a couple of uh, show and tell things since I was late today. Awesome. Yeah, let me spotlight you. We wanted to see your beautiful face the whole time you were talking. <laughs> <laughs> so so here is, here's the fin section. If somebody just hasn't seen one. Uh, this one is... Uh, is one that I bought from Beston, and it's a uh, it's a lunar. Oh, uh, it's unusually large for a lunar. It should have been scandalously expensive, but uh, <laughs> Beston gave me a break. As he does. And, um, Top meteorites. Top meteorite. Sorry. <laughs> and then this is a uh, in C two. Uh, meteorite from one of the uh, dry lake beds in uh, in Nevada. Who cool is that? Very quickly. That's the cool. That's, what, that. the exact, that's so cool. Yeah, it's that lake bed, uh, and uh, so I just pried out the uh, that part of the uh, everyone the, should, the mud crack. Everyone should, that's how it should be. That's awesome. so cool. Uh, it wasn't an original idea. I copied Norm Lerman, uh, who had done who had done that before, and so that one sits uh, in here because that uh, that playa dust is super super fine and gets into everything. And then we talked uh, a couple of meetings ago about uh, shatter cones. Oh yeah. And uh, this is a piece of a shatter cone, if I can get it to focus. Um, an Agudal. Wow. Yeah, it looks like an Agudal. Agudal. Yeah, Wait. and if I illuminate it right, you can see the, uh, the sort of horsetail radiating look to it. And this one is very interesting in that it was a layered uh, shatter cone. So you can see on the inside the uh, there we go. You can see the yes. mm -hmm. sculpture on the inside 
Are they going the in outside? Are they oriented? They're going in the same direction. Yeah, the uh, the bulb of uh, of percussion was uh, just a, a little ways above this. If you yeah, so there's if you no get one of these cool reflection on one side that you know gives you a real like how did that happen kind of effect in those things. Um, well, it it does have you know you can see you can see there the the flow line or not not really flow lines but the uh, the radiating lines and it's got a little bit of them down one edge but they're very hard to yeah you know, down that down that sharp edge near the top you can see they uh they flow through there um but that's uh that's what a shatter cone will look like that looks vaguely familiar is that one you might have gotten from me Pat? Um, is that in the big box? It may well. Oh no, actually, this is one that yeah. I got from uh, uh, the Comet Shop. Uh, so Sergey and those guys. Oh uh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you know Sergey. I mean, uh, uh, Dima is the one that discovered those, right? Uh, yes. Yes. And and this does uh, Agadol. Um, Shattercone uh, collected by Discoverer. So yeah, this would have been one. That's cool. One of the ones that he he actually collected himself. Oh no, but I mean, like he like well yeah, but I mean he like discovered discovered it. Like he proved that that yeah. thing. I mean, you probably know that. I'm sorry. I don't mean to no, probably didn't. But uh, but yeah, that's, that's an impact. Shatter. Yeah. 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 Uh, talking talking about yeah. meteorites. Do any of these or division fossil meteorites ever come in the market? You mean Sorry, fossil? say again, do any of the, you know, the, the fossils? Ones were the ones that were discovered in Sweden, I think, in some or oh. division quarries? Um, I, I've heard some people looking for them or you know, uh, looking to purchase them, but I have never actually seen one uh, on the market or described as being on the market. Um, they're not terribly common. I think there's, you know, a handful of them, and I think they're all in museums in the Nordic countries. What do you call that? What is uh, that called? They're or a fossil the, meteorite. So there are from the or division period. Well, what makes it a fossil meteorite? Yeah, they're four. They're four hundred million years old. The rocks uh, are four four hundred million years old. Okay. Yeah, there's a shale bed, and they found in, in digging out that shale bed, uh, they found in a couple of areas, uh, you know, sort of golf ball sized um, uh, dark objects with a, a rust halo around them. And hmm. I don't know if they're going back 400 million, the order division, but I know that there's some, some really, really, really old, definitely considered paleo. Uh, meteorites coming out of uh, the Atacama now. Uh, huh? I don't think they're that old, but they may be. I thought I saw a paper on one that was in the in the hundreds of millions of years, if I'm not mistaken. I, I have an a, a Gibeon. According to my records, is 200 to 220 million years old. That that uh, ring a bell? Is giving you really that old? Uh, uh, yeah, I all I know is Lake Murray, which is what, 90, well, 90 to 100 million years? At least the one I've heard, ones I've heard of. Yeah, it seems a little maybe exaggerated, maybe, or not necessarily accurate, but it might, I, I, you know, I think aging is a pretty, a metaphor here. pretty slope unless you're actually doing the chlorine and the you know the uh and i think it's chlorine and um i forget what the other uh, dating uh system they use but uh there's some real specific uh terrestrial dating you know age mechanisms they use and there's only a few people that do it and they never almost never do it to almost any of the meteorites that i know of um they do occasionally 
but usually not. Yeah, I can't find it. Argon and chlorine. Yeah, those are the two I think that they use for terrestrial. Those are the two most most likely used. Okay, so this this one is difficult to illuminate, but got a lip around it. One, yeah, one of the um, one of the is it a meteorite um, clues that we use is that meteorites are almost never spherical. Uh, they they almost always have a flattened or some other sort of, of shape. This one is the uh, the closest to a spherical meteorite that I've ever found, um, and this is one that I got uh, years ago from Sarah Overland in a big lot of meteorites. But it is actually pretty much spherical, and it is oriented. You can see the right there, yeah, lower lip there and uh, it's it's present on this other side too but it's you have to play with the lighting some more but but you could, there's definite flow lines yeah. that come back and, uh, and a lip edge on it and then I've got one more that is kind of a funny shape um, you're kind of a funny shape well, I'm funny looking. <laughs> um, Oriented with red lips. And uh, right here is a megachondrial. It's about uh, 12, mil 12 millimeters in diameter or so. But this one is actually uh, oriented. So this is a, the face side. And then across the top, there are uh, regmoglyphs that are aligned that show flow across this direction and along the side there you can see the orientation of the regnoglyphs and then uh, the back side is this sort of stippled sort of stippled look wow that gonna have to work on the lighting But anyhow, that's a, another another kind of interesting one with a with a mega chondrule to boot. That's pretty slick. I I have uh, I have a test for everyone. Which one of these, if any, is a meteorite? Does anyone want to venture a guess? The one on the right? Both of right. them. I see the one on the right. The one maybe, on the right. This maybe. one here is a meteorite. Is that what we're saying? No, looks like it. It looks like On the far know. right, it looks more metallic. Hmm. Well, let me do a reveal on one of them. Uh. Well, yeah, that's a meteorite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> booyah, booyah. Okay, so now we're looking at this one. Is this a meteorite? Flag. And there's a little window for you guys. Uh, let's see, not. Yeah, that one, that one looks more like a concretion. Yeah, like magnetite. Yeah. yeah. Right. So everyone, and I'm, I'm only doing this to show you how, it, how hard it is to identify a meteorite over a crappy picture, okay? Because we get asked to identify crap all day long. I showed you two of them. Everyone liked this one. No one liked this one. You guys would have walked away from a meteorite. This one here, everyone seems to think it's terrestrial. Yeah, the, the other thing we always ask people Go ahead. The other thing we always ask people is for photographs of all sides of the rock. Correct. Oh, yeah. Sorry, my connection's breaking up I again. Bond to a magnet on a yeah. scale of ten. Yeah, because we ask people for uh, looks at, at all sides. Because if I wanted to, I could crop out that little chondral-looking thing 
and tell people that it's a meteorite. Yeah. But when you take the entire thing into consideration and realize that it has no magne magnetic uh. properties whatsoever, um, well, I can't, it, trust me, there's no magnetic whatsoever. So I keep this as a nice weathered meteor wrong that I paid 30 cents a gram for in Tucson. <laughs> but unless you, uh, unless you buy some meteor wrongs or find some meteor wrongs and compare them to meteorites, I mean, literally ones that look extremely similar, you know, are totally different on the inside. So um, just, it's, it's, it's hard to identify a meteorite sometimes just by, you know, a picture, especially of one you know, with a potato camera. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. That happens all the time in rocks and minerals. Somebody has a block of rocks and they're asking what these are, you know. Well, first you need a location. That would help. And, uh, you know, you know uh, if you take a lousy picture, you're not giving the person who's trying to identify them any help or any clues. So... And, and people don't realize it's most important to take the best possible photograph you can. Absolutely. And there, there are some people, no matter what you tell them, they won't believe you. They're convinced. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. Yeah. This rock yeah. right here. I, I'm... This rock right here. I, I was having a beer with a guy. He swore up and down it was a meteorite. It's heavy, but it's actually pyrite. You can see it there. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Paid three hundred dollars for this hunk of pyrite. Wow. He tried to sell it to me yes. the same thing, but I, I I bent over backwards trying to tell him that it wasn't a meteorite. But he was so I bought him a couple of beers. <laughs> <laughs> but he was so upset. But so he went partners with the guy this it. thing. That, that's my meteor wrong right there. Mm -hmm. I, I tried to give it back to him. He wouldn't take it back. So I thought. <laughs> <laughs> and that's unfortunately yeah. one, of, one of the problems that uh, meteorite yeah. um, experts, whatever, um, yeah. run into is we get asked to identify stuff that a rock hound uh, may have found. And now they may have, you know, 50, 60 hours into hunting in the heat or through some brush, scratched up legs arguments with the spouse this is the one thing they have to show and everything bets on it well, this is they're staking their name on it like this is my retirement fund it's the first um american lunar and he, you just he swore, up, he swore up and down that he heard it fall it fell in the <laughs> back of the building that he was in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, i don't think so well, i spend i spend at least an hour a day on meteorite or meteor wrong and is it a meteorite and then most of the other meteorite pages have devolved into here's a picture of my rock is it a meteorite and i you know i i've, I've learned a lot uh i've also learned a lot of psychology so many of these are great grandpa found this and it's been the doorstop oh, yeah. at the farmhouse since 1820 yeah. and uh you know it's a meteorite and, and yeah we're all gonna retire rich and then you know i i start rattling off the reasons why it isn't a meteorite and then about 25 percent of the people will tell me well you're full of shit because you can't tell if it's a meteorite from a picture no. okay <laughs> let's let's talk about logic for a minute <laughs> so why did you post pictures of a rock and yeah. ask us whether it's a meteorite or not <laughs> yeah it's like hey it's like going to your doctor then arguing no my pancreas is fine it's like how the hell do you know <laughs> you know one of the things i do when i give my my talks at to elementary schools I, I i bring a bunch of rocks including this thing this cannonball i have a wow. foreign cannonball i just bought this at a gift shop for seven bucks and um, I said, okay, so I show five pictures of, you know, five rocks. I said, which one's a meteorite? Invariably, they think this is a meteorite. Really? So <laughs> I tell them, they're never around. They're never around, but they still insist. It's a meteorite egg. Yeah. The other thing I show them, I have this, uh, this thunder eggs, the biconoid thunder egg that I found 40 years ago or something. Just a geode. 
Yeah. I, I've never cut it. I, I like the outside of it. But oh, um, they, they think this is a, a meteorite as well. Huh. Just a, it's called a biconoid thunder egg. And I got this at a little gift shop, rock shop in Sedona, Arizona about 44 years ago. The Vortex. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I'm not rock. very familiar with those. When you cut it open, would you hope it to be like a geode on the interior? Well, you no, know, it, it actually is solid. It's not hollow like a geode. Really? Um, yeah, I, I've seen a lot of pictures. I don't have a hard to know because I'm just in love with the outside of that thing. It looks mm -hmm. the, the ridge look like a webbing on, on a baseball to me, sort of mm -hmm. raised. But um, but no, I've seen photos of them. They they're beautiful on the inside, but um, they're kind of like spidered uh, opal type, you know, things. But you you can find them. They're relatively common. Well, after and looking at all these little grass inside too. Pardon me? You know what I find interesting is people who say, I'm not going to buy a meteorite, I'm going to go out and find my own. Oh, yeah. Well, we all know it's not that easy and it takes a lot of research. Yeah. And, you know, you have to equip yourself with certain items yes. to go and search out. And people will claim like they pick a rock up on the beach. That's a meteorite. Oh, yeah. yeah you know, it's ballast yeah. from an old sailing ship. Yep. I, I had a conversation with someone just a few days ago, and uh, they were the same way. And I said, look, <clears throat> it's as likely, it's even less likely than you being struck by lightning twice. Yeah. And you can do everything in the world possible to enhance your odds of getting struck with lightning twice. Why don't you go do that, please? <laughs> <laughs> if somebody comes in with a big rock that's you know, bowling ball size, uh, and, you know, you look at it, and it's obviously it's not a meteorite. And, and yeah. their other comeback is, well, if you can't tell me exactly what kind of rock it is, then you can't tell me that it's not a meteorite, which, of I course, see that we know is all crazy all, all the time. Yes. Um, and uh, so I tell them, all right, well, uh, there's roughly the same mass of diamonds on Earth as there are of media recoverable meteorites on earth and how likely would you be to wander around in your driveway and pick up a baseball sized diamond not very that's a good point and this book and all the mathematics in it this is opic uh, physics of meteor flight through the atmosphere tells you that round or spherical is not a shape you're going to find very often oh, no. and yet I, I have had month-long arguments with people that the rusted out mill ball that they found three of, that are all curiously the same diameter, uh, is a meteorite. And now the one of the newest ones is from uh, Northwest Africa. Uh, they, they, they make these mill balls and they're for, they're for milling um, ore, uh, metallic ore, into a powder to make it more easy to process. Yeah. Uh, they make these milling balls out of ceramic as well, and they sort of look like oversized cue balls. And uh, there are about a dozen and a half people over the last several years that I've had to remove from Is It a Meteorite because they're claiming these things are lodanorites, and they're super rare, and they came from this particular spot. And who who told them that was a Lodanorite? I don't know, but um, well, after seeing all this nasty meteor wrongs, let's take a look at a meteorite for a second. We just need to wash our eyeballs off a little bit. This is just an absolutely gorgeously shaped meteor. I mean, it's. It's got it on all sides. Yeah, absolutely. That's about as many regmaglyphs and stuff as you can fit yeah. on a small meteorite. Yeah, so let's just take a look at the crust. Remnant there isn't crust. any roll rollover lip on that one anywhere, is there? No, you just you have uh, 
a soft a soft angle here, a soft yeah. edge. Yeah. Uh, it obviously it's it's a it's a single stone that broke up. Um, I would I would say, but early in the ablation flight, this, there's a, there's a, a nice layer. Yeah. But yeah, that's this is one. Um, I actually had available on my sale on Saturday. Um, I'm not trying to sell it or anything, but it's three, yeah, 300 grams. It's a gorgeous. So yeah, now, now we can wash our eyeballs of all the media wrongs. <laughs> Does anyone have anything they'd like to show off? We'd love to see it. Is anybody interested in looking at a white court real quick? Sure. Yes, we are. Give a second. I'm hoping that Jonathan Ospina is reaching for something. My buddy Jonathan finally, finally on the line. Brazil in the house. <laughs> this is a white cord I got a few years ago. It's kind of a thin, but it's larger than what you would normally find. Yeah. If you can see it very well. It doesn't look very shrapnel, though. Oh, no, it's not shrapnel at all. It's good, solid. But a nice natural patina as well. Yeah, yeah. I kept, I kept sometimes I clean it, but not this one. These are kind of hard to come by. That's beautiful. I don't I remember who I got it from, though. We're just going to say it was from Fred McPherson. <laughs> uh, I can probably tell you real quick. Let me see. Uh, let's see. Let me alphabetize these things here in a second. White cord came from... Dr. John Birdsell of Arizona Skies. So important to have a database to keep all your yeah, records. I, I keep, oh my, you should see this database I keep. <laughs> <laughs> I keep everything. I got this is my master logbook right here. This is all the paperwork, indexed, scans, everything for the with identification picture up front. Now this That's is just, you know, Excellent, excellent. I keep everything, all the provenance. I keep triple copies of all the electronic files. A lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> Especially my. Well, worth it though. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I have this thing indexed. I have an Excel sheet that's hot linked to the raw files. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just yeah, who I bought it, when I bought it, what I paid, you know, weight per gram, cost per gram, uh, just everything. I was going to ask, what is weight per gram? I know that, that. that was a, <laughs> tip of the tongue, cost per gram. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's like me not being able to say anomal anomalous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, 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 keep, I keep everything, including the business card. Yeah. Um, that comes from, from scan everything in. So it's, it's uh, yeah. labor, some, the labor some, of love. Some people have asked me, because uh, I, I include a business card, even if you've ordered 10 times, I include uh -huh. a business card. Um, especially if it's an expensive piece, if you ever plan on passing it on, you have my COA or my company, but you yeah. also have my, my business card if you ever need to contact me directly. It, it, yeah, it adds to the whole package. Oh, sure. I've never passed anything yeah. on anybody else, but someday I'll probably have to. My yeah, we're, uh, we are the, um, the keepers of these things during our lifetimes. Yeah, but of course they're uh, uh, thousands or tens of thousands of generations old. So. Yeah. Well, I fear it's my my grandkids' college education. So, my <laughs> son sells them smartly. It's you. They'll pay for that for the kids in college. Well, I've got a li little something that's kind of unusual. Oh, my sound sounds bad on this end. But hopefully, it's not bad. NWA 2965 and EL chondrite, Institute chondrite, EL67, which I've read in a couple of other papers I found online. It's been re tried to reclassify as a nine or ten, but let me see if I can. I'm glad you're uh, presenting this on the Facebook. Yeah, there's only 17 of these in class. I'm going to have to back out of this. I'm sorry, we're going to have to back it up because there's just too much interference. Yeah. 
Is it working now? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. You can look at it anyway. Okay. Well, now we have good audio. Can we see the uh, the cut side? Yeah, it kind of looks like my terrestrial uh, um, meteor wrong. Yeah, that, that's the uh, same one that's uh, El Hagini uh, uh, 001. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's what, it's the EL Melt was, Rock oops. now. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Um, Backwards. It was, it was actually classified as an Albright, I think, at one point. Um, but there's uh, a bunch of that landed in uh, what later turned into an alkaline dry lake bed and was heavily terrestrialized. Yeah. And uh, there's there's some tiny amount of that material that's light blue colored uh, that shows the relic chondrules uh, that uh, that have it as an EL something with chondrules. Yeah. And I have a, a few little pieces made about that big that have the have the blue in them. I did. It was one of the early meteorites I got, and I, I'd read somewhere we were talking about petrified meteorites earlier yeah. that a lot of the what was in that had been terrestrialized, exactly, sort yeah. of, you know, petrified. And uh, so I did yeah. a lot of reading on it, found some papers, and uh, but like I say, apparently they want it's been reclassified by Washington University and somebody else as an EL4, but it's still EL67 in the in the Met Bull. But it fascinated me because, again, there's only 17 of them, including two Antarctics. Well, there, uh, uh, there's several uh, NWA numbers that that uh, uh, meteorite has been classified under. And, really? Um, and uh, El Fagunia is also uh, a classification for that same one. And, Seven, 7401. Uh, yeah, large amount of material spread over a pretty fair distance, and many of them had to be uh, dug out of the ground. So there were people went back to that spot several times. That's kind of why I wanted to show it. I figured I'd learn more about it <laughs> with this group. It's always fun to learn more about these. I don't want to, but I'm going to. I'm going to enjoy it. It's when I do it. Jonathan Ospina is joining us probably from the furthest away. I don't know if he has anything to show off or not, but I'd like to give him the opportunity to give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. Do you have something to show us, buddy? He's probably listening through a translator. Oh, well. That stinks. Um, does anyone have anything? To, oh, Mike Kelly, let's throw it over to you, buddy. So this is something that I've been waiting for for a while as a, as a subtype collector. This was the last subtype that I needed out of the palisites. So rare from uh, Kansas. No, not an Eagle Station type palisite. It's a palisite uh, ungrouped. Oh. So that's not olivine in there. That's pyroxene, as far as what the the uh, the silicates are. Mm -hmm. What's the name of this one? Vermilion. Oh my my! I have I have a piece that was connected to that mm -hmm. on its way. And uh, that was yeah. This is from uh, Mark, but it's a piece right from the Kilgores. So then they were the ones who got the classification. That is awesome provenance. Did uh, Craig's Lyman cut that one? Yes. Yeah, that's what I thought because uh, I, I picked out a piece right above that, I think, when, when we drew out the lines. Yep. That's awesome. Yes. Vermilion, mm -hmm. a, a rare U.S. or a rare Kansas palisite that's not Admire mm. or Brenham. That's awesome. When did that fall, or when was it? When was it discovered? Uh, one second. We uh, I had the I had the metal open for a second there. Uh, I think it was uh. uh it was ninety one. It was found and yeah, ninety one. Recognized ninety five. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. 
It's cool at silicate. That's neat. Yeah, I have a I have a twenty three gram something like that slice in route from Craig that I'm every every day the doorbell rings I'm thinking oh my god that's my vermilion and then it's not it's just Amazon delivering butt wipes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can expect yours to be ten times this large then. But yeah, I was I was glad to just get this little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I told Mark it's personal collection bound, dude. You're not gonna see it on, up for sale, I guarantee you. Well, put this way, I won't see it up for sale because I'll be dead. <laughs> you guys know if anybody that has a nothing meteorite. Nothing Arizona? Yeah. The one, the only one I almost had was from KD, and they sold it just before it got to their booth. Oh, God. Yeah, don't have it. Don't know who has it. Yeah, it's pretty much all bought up. Wow. Uh, uh, Topher, you might try Jonathan again. He's there. Oh, Jonathan, let's... Uh... Uh, you know, does he have a camera going that I'm not seeing? Uh, he's he's there on chat. Okay. Um, let me see here. Let me chat. Tell us something. Yeah, for, for guys who don't know him, uh, Jonathan is a. Um, uh, he's been collecting. He's a young guy, but he's been collecting for twenty years or so. He is one of the most valuable people contributing on the Facebook groups for meteorite identification. He is just a workhorse. He's, he's done a huge amount of that work. I see him all over the place. Yeah, he's actually uh, helped me uh, do some uh, moderation on, on some of my pages as well. He's very knowledgeable. I don't know if Jonathan can hear us or not. If he understands us right now, we'd love to, for you to show off something. You can even talk in Spanish or Portuguese, whatever you want. I'm sure I can get YouTube to put uh, captions on it. Well, we'll have to work it out next time. You know what? I'm going to work with uh, I'm going to work with with uh, Jonathan on the side. Put a little uh, video together, and maybe we can present it next next time. Um, does anyone have anything they're dying to show off? Because I think we're gonna, I think Pat is reaching for something. I'm not quite sure. Uh, no, I, I think I'm good. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Um, today was a really good, uh, really, really good hangout. We had a lot of new people on. Um, broke some major announcement. We're going to go live with ASU and Dr. Lawrence Garvey next week, same time as always. Uh, we were very fortunate enough to have Neil Buckland join us today. Um, and I, I didn't get a chance to show this off earlier. So I'm going to, these are soon to be collector's items. I'm very fortunate enough when I went to the, to the installation, I got one of each. Well, I got this one. And then when I went to ASU with Neil, I, talked I wrenched the last one he had out of his hands <laughs> okay the last one he had I now have so by the way um, I don't know if I, I I didn't know if this would be something you'd want me to share but I'll sh I'll show you um, um, something how do you how, can you make me uh, absolutely so the the little booklet that he's showing right now is um, uh, eight by eight, eight inches by eight inches, and this is uh, oh, <laughs> it's, <invisible. laughs> it's disappearing. Um, yeah, let me turn that off. <laughs> uh, how do I turn off my background? Let's see. It's super hard to sell a book you can't see. Uh, I think if you there's a setting you can set it to nothing. Is it under general? It's under video. stop video video settings. Under video. Um, There's a little light Is that a micro book you might be interested in? Background. Here we go. I found it. None. Okay. So um, this is, uh, it's the same size as that book, but it, I was just doing this as an experiment. It's a, a print that would be double sided. And you know, like a desktop mm -hmm. shelf print, 
Yeah. So, you know, you could, yeah. you could put it on your desk or on your shelf or whatever. And so, I don't know, this is just, some, just some, something I've been experimenting with as a way to, you know, the big prints that are in the galleries, um, you know, are a bit expensive. And I understand that, that most people probably can't splurge on something like that. But these smaller things that I'm offering on the website are going to be a lot more affordable and, um, you know, I can ship them pretty much anywhere. Uh, so this, I don't know, I'd love, I, I, I think it's a cool idea, but I don't know if anyone will actually buy it. So if you have any input, um, I'd be happy to hear what you have to say. <laughs> there's enough med oh, like heads. It. Yeah, there's enough med heads that, uh, that I'm sure there'll be some crazy enough ones to, to put that somewhere in their house, like me. <laughs> hey, Topher, yes. you mentioned, you know, a meteorite book with a micro, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's your we original up, oh, wow. meteorite yeah, we boat up one with a micro in it. That one. <laughs> <laughs> what year is that one? This is the this is the fifth edition. So okay. that's what was sixty seven or I think. Looks pretty old. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, fifty seven. Yeah. So yeah, that's yeah, part of the, is, yeah. yeah, if you can find a first edition which was uh, was forty two, yeah. Then uh, those are those are mint as far as uh, what everyone's looking for. But this was cool because it was part of the uh, part of the kit with the uh, sparks from the celestial bomb, the little uh, spheroids in addition That's to the cool. book the and the impact type card. card. Yep. So that was uh, that's a that's a that's the quintessential book for uh, me, uh, micro or uh, collectors. Wow. Well, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get all the way to, I'm not going to get all the way to the first edition, but here's a 69. And here is a, wait for it, 46. So that's about as low as I can go, but yes, Very nice. definitely collectible. Being a being a dealer, reseller, fan, lover, connoisseur of meteorites in Arizona, man, if I don't have this book, I need to just quit what I'm doing. <laughs> Are you going well, to get that uh, classified? You want to make me the uh, want to make me the the camera for a second? I'm not fortunate enough to have the one with the dust jacket, but um, this is. Uh, this is the 1933 only one edition, our stone pelted planet. And this is one of the only books I know of that's actually worth more if it's not signed. Really? That's Nininger. Yeah. Nininger, and this one is signed, of course. Nininger um, sold most of these in his little museum there by the crater. And uh, so he autographed most. Um, one of the rarest of the Nininger books is this pair yeah. on uh, orientation and shapes. And this was a part one, part two, but part one came out in 77 and part two didn't come out until 81. So four years apart. And these things have a glued binding and they are notorious that if you open them up any amount at all mm -hmm. the binding goes pop and all the pages come loose but two paperback books these are about 400 bucks a set now oh wow that's great yeah so we collect and talk about everything here well I, i'm really happy and thankful that everyone uh, was able to join us. Like I said, we had uh, uh, Neil Buckland joining us. We, we announced, uh, we almost had uh, Dr. Tony Irving with us. We announced that next week uh, we're going to have a super special uh, hangout with part of the session being, it may be a short hangout. We may have to cut it short after, after we're done at ASU, but we'll see how and what uh, the doctor and I can put together. But 
I'm gonna send out a, a link to a list of ASU's collection. If there's something you're dying to see, if your name is Jesse Piper and you wanna see something from Jap Japan, um, and if, if you see anything on the list that is super special that you wanna see, Dr. Lawrence Garvey will take it out and make it available for us. So uh, again, if you, I hate saying this, but please smash the like button. Wow, I can't believe I said smash. Thanks everyone. Appreciate you guys showing up and showing off today. Have a great Thank week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Hey, John, for thanks, special evening yeah. for me, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone, that answered my questions. Awesome. Yeah, we're getting a bunch of – I got a, a screen full of smiling and waving people. It's awesome. Thanks, guys. Have a nice one. <laughs> Thanks. See you next week. Thank well. you. Stay up.